We all love the stories of Christ's birth, all that surrounds that birth. And now we enter into that time of what follows the birth of Christ. We're going to be reading from Luke chapter 2, at beginning at the 22nd verse. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce your soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping, fasting, and praying day and night. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak to him, to, to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And, chi and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. And the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wow. There is a lot going on in this passage. Just like before, during Christmas Eve, we read so much that was going on. We read about the prophets foretelling of the birth of Christ, the birth of the Messiah, the coming of the Lord. We listen to the angelic messages to both Mary and Joseph. We were there with the shepherds hearing the angelic message of the birth of Christ as he came into the world. Many details we covered, and in the same way, there is much before us this morning. But I'd like to sharpen our focus. I'd like to zoom in, as it were, and look at the character Simeon. In particular, I'd like to look even more sharply at Simeon and what was said of him 
namely that it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Christ. He would not see death before he saw the Lord's Christ. And then if possible, to zoom in even a little more to that word, that simple word, before. And yet there's so much that hangs on that word. We could have just as easily read past it, paid no attention to it, but yet there's so much powerfully behind that word before. In order to look at it appropriately, it's probably proper that we do a little homework, a little preparation, that we kind of do some before work before we deal with before. That might be one too many befores. But I think you know what I'm trying to say. Let's, let's get to that stuff that we need to deal with first, our homework. Two items. First, that of rituals, and then next, that of waiting. Let's deal with the rituals. We are familiar with many parts of the story of Christ coming into the world, of the birth of Jesus. But we're not as familiar. We don't know as well that which follows his birth, that which happens afterwards. Oh, we know of the shepherds and the angels appearing to them in the field. We even know of the wise men seeing the star in the east. But we often skip over some of the rituals that take place, some of those items that take place after his birth. We're familiar with the idea of circumcision, that we've got three different rituals we'll look at, and that first one is circumcision. We're familiar with that. We know that on the eighth day, a Hebrew boy would be circumcised. Such was true, and we saw it as we listened to God's word this morning. We heard that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. We're less familiar with the next two items, the next two rituals that happen. And when we might need to remind ourselves so we don't diminish the idea of ritual, rituals are those things which help us to learn and to remember and to grow. So circumcision was a sign that Jesus was part of the community that God had set apart. And these next two rituals we'll look at that we're not as familiar with, and yet there they are listed right in the Gospel of Luke, are also important. The second one was that of purification. We're told that Mary, and in the case of what Luke says, Mary and Joseph, needed to be purified after giving birth to Jesus. Now the law suggested that, not suggested, but said that after 40 days, after bearing a male child, one had to wait 40 days before being purified. And if you had a female child, you had to wait 80 days. And so the act of being purified was to go to the temple and offer sacrifices Sacrifices expressing one's sin that were all broken and need of God's healing. And so Mary and Joseph, having traveled from the north down to the south to Bethlehem, now find in traveling back home to Nazareth that Jerusalem and the temple are on the way. So it works out well for them to stop and make this time of purification. And we know they do so, and we know the offering they give, that they're quite poor, for they give the lowest amount for those who have very little. And then the third ritual is a ritual of dedication, of giving over the firstborn male. You see, it was demanded by God that every firstborn male, whether it be 
cattle or sheep or even human would be given to the Lord, consecrated to the Lord. In the case of animals, they would be sacrificed. But a male child would be consecrated to the Lord and then redeemed, bought back. All this would take place so that a child would eventually grow up and turn and ask the natural question that might be on your mind as well as, why? Why do we do this? Why do we have to be redeemed? Why does the firstborn always have to be consecrated? And it was an act of reminder, a teaching moment, to turn back and say we were once enslaved in Egypt. And God, in his delivering us out of Egypt, in in his bringing us out of that bondage, killed all the firstborns. And so we are reminded that the firstborns belong to the Lord, and so we consecrate them to the Lord. Remembering that God has redeemed us, that God has bought us and brought us out of Egypt. So what do we have in these three rituals? We have a ritual in which one is set apart as part of the community of faith that God has set aside so that all nations would be blessed. We have a ritual of purification, a cleansing action, in which we need to be cleansed of that which is wrong within us before the Lord. And we have an action of consecration and redemption, an action whereby we are reminded that God has brought us out of bondage. And Luke has craftily put these very common practices in the narrative so that we might see something even more powerful that's happening in Jesus. Up to this point, everything is the same for every firstborn male. This is what would have happened with everyone. But Luke is lifting them up so that we might see that God is deeply behind what is about to happen. That's the first part of our background. The second part of our background is not ritual, but waiting. And in this part, we see that there are two individuals that God has set apart who are waiting, waiting to see God's anointed one. We'll deal with the second one first, Anna, the prophetess. We might remember from our journey through Advent that a prophet is one who speaks on behalf of God. A prophet is a messenger of God, and a prophetess was no different, a messenger of God. And Anna plays that part very well. We know that she's 84 years old, or depending on the interpretation, maybe even older. It could have been that she's lived 84 years since her husband's death, making her significantly old. She was there day in and day out in the temple. She was a fixture if you went to the temple. You know, some will go to New York City and see the common sights, and they'll even see some of those fixtures, such even as the naked cowboy. I can't believe I just compared the naked cowboy with Anna the prophetess. But the point is that Anna would have been someone that everyone saw and everyone knew of. For she was there day in and day out for years on end, praying and fasting before the Lord. So everyone would have known her. So imagine the surprise when she starts to speak a message of the Lord about this child, Jesus. Which brings us to the other person who was waiting, Simeon, the person upon whom our morning work focuses. 
Simeon. What do we know about Simeon? Well, we know two things, really. The first we know directly, and the second part we know rather indirectly, or rather we can infer it. What do we know directly? Well, we know that he was righteous and devout. Righteous and devout. They kind of sound as if they might be saying the same thing twice. It's the same thing. And that would be a normal understanding, for in the Hebrew, often a thought was repeated and said again in slightly a different way. So we would be at no fault to think that to say that he was righteous and devout was a way of saying the same thing twice. But really, there's something of a difference here. He was righteous, and we know that righteous means one who truly follows God, who seeks to do God's will in life. More than just following the rules that God has laid out, but truly trying to listen to what God is directing even to that individual, to live one's life as God would call us to live, righteously, to live right before God. Now, devout, that's another word. Devout is really the formation of two separate words. One part of that word is to do well or to take great care. And the second part of the word is to take or receive. I might take or receive something very quickly or fast or with little care. But to take and receive in a way that is to do well or with great care is a very specific kind of receiving. So think for a moment if we were setting the table for lunch and we were throwing paper plates around the table, we might throw them to one another. That's just taking and receiving. But if we were to pass out the china, then we might do that with greater care, passing and making sure the other person had hold before we let go. To be devout probably is better interpreted to be reverent, to take and receive with great care and to do so very well. What we're hearing is that Simeon took great care to receive all that God was giving him. He didn't just receive God's good news as one part of life and go on to do everything else he wanted to do. He didn't look at his watch to see how long worship was going to be because he wanted to get on with the day. No, he received all that God gave with great care and did it to his best. He was both righteous and devout. That was something we knew directly, and, and we see that it's further confirmed that the Holy Spirit speaks to Simeon as a part of a response to his righteousness and devout. We know that directly. It's right there in the Scripture. The second part of what we know about Simeon is a little more indirect, or rather we might more infer it, and that's the matter of his age. How old is he? Likely, in your mind's eye, as in mine, we probably see him as an old man, though we're not told that directly. So how do we get to that place where if I ask you to close your eyes and ask you to envision Simeon, the chances are you envision an old man. How do we get to that place? What was it in the passage that suggested that to us? Was it that we later read that Anna, Anna was very old and so we just kind of Bring that back upon Simeon? I suspect there's a little more than that. It's the fact that he's been waiting. He's been waiting. Now, we all know what it is to wait. Sometimes we have to wait a few minutes. Sometimes we have to wait a few hours. Sometimes a few days. And, you know, many of us have been in the process of waiting for Christmas to come, counting the days. Maybe we did so with our Advent calendars. And then there's the waiting that goes on for one generation after another. The waiting that takes years upon years. And that's more the sense 
that we get with this Simeon, that he's been waiting. The second reason we infer that he probably was old was we're told that he was told by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before seeing the Lord's Christ. He would not see death before seeing the Lord's Christ. Well, seeing death is a reference to how old one might be. When you're young, you don't think about death that much. It doesn't come by that often. When you grow up a little bit, you might start to prepare or make accommodations just in case, but still, it's a far-off thought. But when we're older, when we're advanced in years, when we've lived much of what we know life has to offer, we're much more conscious that death is nearer, that it may come at any hour or any day. Our thoughts are different on the matter. And so it is with Simeon that he's told that he would not see death before seeing the Lord's Christ. So with Simeon, we have an understanding that he's older. He's been waiting a significant amount of time. And that death seems nearer than God's promises. And yet God has promised. In the same way that God promised Abraham, and Abraham lived to a good old age before he had his son, we see that God once again is calling us to wait but has such a fulfilling promise. You see, in many ways, we are like Simeon. And it's why it's important to do the background we've done, the background of looking at the rituals as well as those waiting, so that we can now focus in on Simeon, to focus in on that statement that he would not see death before seeing the Lord's Christ. That word before, there is so much that hangs upon it. For that word before has a promise attached to it. We know what it is to understand the word before. And when you have a word before, you have that which comes before and that which comes after. And in this case, that which comes after are before is the idea of death. Death. You know, there are two things that are certain in life, as the saying goes, death and taxes. And that part taxes, we've been doing everything we can to free ourselves of that. We have some idea that maybe we can be freed of that concept but the idea of being freed of death is much harder to grasp. For it seems a certainty, a promise that is to come, that it's an absolute that death will come. And so we're told that Simeon will see death. But there's also something else that he will see. In both cases, his sight is focused. That which comes after is death, but there is that which will come before, that which will eclipse death, that which Simeon is going to be able to see before he sees death. And what is that he will be able to see before death? It is the Lord's Christ. Simeon has been promised by the Holy Spirit that he will see the Lord's Christ. Now just, what do we mean by Christ? Here is a word that we throw around the church and feel certain we understand when we say Jesus Christ, and, and we know the word Christ, and yet, what do we mean? Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word, Messiah. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word, Messiah. And that helps us a great deal. It does well for us until we ask ourselves, 
What do we mean by Messiah? Oh, we know that the Messiah is the promised one, the one that God would send. We know that the Psalms and the prophets speak of that one whom God would send. So there came to be this expectation of a Messiah, the one whom God would send. But still, what is behind that word Messiah? Quite simply, anointed. Anointed. God's anointed one. Now, when you break down even the word anointed, we see that it has this word of to rub or to spread. To anoint is to rub or to spread. Think of of old leather and how when you rub oil into it 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 brings it back to life when you when you immerse it and and rub it in it brings back life or when you spread it out there's a cleansing action oil was used to cleanse as well the king and the priest would be anointed. And it wasn't just simply to take oil on them and they wondered how quickly could they run and get it off. But rather it was a cleansing action. To be anointed was to be cleansed. And so when we speak of God sending His Christ, His Messiah, His anointed one, His one who would rub and spread a cleansing action throughout, we have a better sense of what we mean when we say the Lord's Christ, the Lord's anointed one, the Lord's one who would cleanse and redeem and restore. This is the one who was hoped for. This is the one who is more than some top military chief or great king who would throw off the other nations. This is the one who was promised who would come and restore and cleanse all of humanity. And so Simeon was told that he would not see death before He saw the Lord's Christ. In other words, he would not see death before he saw life. Life comes in and eclipses death. Simeon, as he takes that child into his arms, is in a position now to hold God's anointed one, God's life to the world. Why is this important for us this morning? Why does Luke record this event for us? More than just a moment of saying, ah, there again, see, it's God's anointed one. Even Simeon sees it, even Anna sees it. More than that. Simeon is blessed. That before he sees death, he sees life. He sees God's promise to God's people. And not just the Israelites, the Hebrews, but for all people, the Gentiles as well, as Simeon goes on to say. And we, like Simeon, as followers of Jesus Christ, now find ourselves in the same position. That as we live in this life in which the Christ has come, and we await the coming of Christ again, as we live in this in-between state, we too, like Simeon, are in a place in which we have seen God's promise, God's life for all people, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We too, like Simeon, have now seen Life before death. So we are called to live as Simeon then lived. 
saying that you can dismiss now your servant, for you have shown me life before death. Not a life of just living, but your life. The life that you promise us. Your promise to rub into us. To spread throughout us. Your life-giving Spirit. Your love and your forgiveness. Your grace. Your mercy. All of that is in the life that you now promise us. This morning, we are promised once again the incredible gift that we are given in Jesus Christ. A chance to glimpse and see the life that is to come and the life that even can be now as we live now, not for ourselves, but for Him. As we live righteously and devoutly, we consecrate ourselves once again to God as we purify ourselves in the blood of Jesus Christ and recognize that we have been set apart to be a blessing not for ourselves but for all people so that others may come to know of the name of Jesus, that they may come to know of the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. All of this happened before we will see death. And after death, we will see life again. May God be praised. Let us pray together.